Hi guys, hello, how are you? Okay, so today I'm going to tell you a story about our relationship with sodium chloride salt. It's not a new story. It's actually as old as life itself, but it's a story that is very profound and it's etched into our DNA. And more than that, it's the thread that weaves through our societies and it knits together our ancient and modern societies. So we see, for example, that 2,000 years ago, Pliny the Elder, when he was writing his history of the Roman Empire, wrote about the practice of paying legionnaires in cakes of salt. And this was called the salarium, or salary, as we call this today. We see in both Eastern and Western religions the idea of the covenant of salt. So when you're sealing the deal, forming new collaborations, making signs of friendship, you do this by exchanging something of great value, in this case, salt. And this persists in the first picture. This is a cutout of Da Vinci's The Last Supper, and you can see in the red box out there, Judas, Judas Iscariot has knocked over with his elbow the salt cellar, and the salt, this valuable salt, has spilled out all across the table. This is now in, in, in history as a sign of ill omen. And it's in the common practice that you all probably know where you take a pinch of salt if you spill it and you throw it over your left shoulder to dispel the devil that is lurking there because you've spilt something amazingly valuable. But this isn't just about the ancient world. Even in relatively modern history, we see things like this. This is the inland salt hedge that was built, uh, during, uh, in the, by, built in India by the British Empire, uh, reached its peak in around 1850. It was actually a hedge that was two meters wide, two meters tall, made of impenetrable gorse-like bush so that you could not get through this other than at certain um, gateways which were manned by British forces, 12,000 British soldiers there at the peak. Why was this built? For a single reason, it was to collect the salt tax because salt was being moved from regions, where, uh, regions rich in salt mines across to the Bengal provinces, which were low in salt. And the British built this so that they could claim the value of the salt through tax. So as you can see from this, salt really has made underpinned our socioeconomic development and it's made our civilizations what they are. Why is that? Well, it's probably because it made us what we are. This, if you're a physiologist like me, is what I think of when somebody says Homer, not the, uh, the other yellow dude. This is Homer Smith, who was professor of physiology at NYU and is, in the modern era, one of the most profound thinkers of why we are what we are. And he wrote in 1953 this book here, From Fish a philosopher. It was his idea, his thesis about our relationship, biological relationship with salt, that enabled us to develop and evolve from marine dwelling creatures into sophisticated human beings that we are today that can have the luxury and the freedom to spend our life discussing ideas and discussing, like we're doing today actually, discussing ideas and discussing how we came to be what we are. You can see from this why I pursued a career in science and not art. And I also accept that it's a gross oversimplification of evolution. But this process starts when our first fishy ancestors decided to leave the marine environment and flop themselves onto land and live an independent life there. And if you think about this, this is a fundamental game changer. It's a massive challenge because what you have to do is you have to go from an environment where salt is abundant. It surrounds your entire body. You don't have to think about it. You need no strategies to evolve to deal and get the salt that you need for everyday life. As soon as you set foot on land, you change this environment completely. You go now to an environment where salt is scarce and it's geographically isolated. You need, there's a biological imperative to develop 
strategies that you can go and seek out salt, that you can ingest the salt, and that you can hold that salt in your body. Those that evolved those strategies survived. Those that didn't perished. And when I'm talking about salt, I don't want you to really think that I'm talking about the crystals of salt that you'll be familiar with from the salt shakers. This is actually the biological salt, so salt in solution, which separates out into its component parts, a sodium ion and a chloride ion. Why is this important to all of us? Well, there are three really key reasons. The first is it controls our blood pressure. It holds the water in our vessels and allows us to pump that oxygenated blood to our tissues which need it to do our everyday lives. The distribution of salt also underpins the electrical activities of our nerves. So having exactly the right amount of salt that you need in your body enables your nerves to work as they should. It enables your muscles, including the heart, to contract as you should. And we know in our hospitals today that if this balance goes askew, people become very, very ill. So Dr. Smith focused his book on uh, two aspects of salt. Uh, one was the fact that we evolved a gut, which is an in incredibly efficient salt extracting system. So you take in almost all of the salt that we eat and very little passes out of the GI tract. He also focused on the kidney, which has to filter our blood. It has to remove the toxins from our blood, but it does this while separating out toxins from salt, keeps that salt in the body. But there's more to it than that. We know now that our brain, our fishy ancestral brain, has evolved behavioral patterns that sense when we need to have salt and sets in train certain behaviors to make us seek that salt out. We also have a tongue that is incredibly sensitive to sodium chloride as to other salts and allows us to discriminate what is salty food and what isn't. If these four dots are connected, harmony is reached and we become very happy. And actually, we do become very happy because these same salt-seeking behaviors in our head are connected to pleasure centers. If you eat salt, you get a good feeling. These are the same pleasure centers that have been hijacked in recent times by recreational drugs, for example. So, all told, Professor Smith's hypothesis is that our need for salt has driven the evolution of our DNA to retain this concept, the concept of salt balance. So the salt we eat is balanced by the kidney, which excretes the salt that we don't need, and we keep in our body exactly the amount of salt that we need for our biological processes. Hmm. This is evolution. And it's a rhetorical question when I'm asking what went wrong. You know, I don't want any, answer, any, any suggestions here. So what did go wrong? From what happened from the caveman here to the caveman there uh, that is putting our existence today in peril? Well, it's all about the changing environment that we live in. If you go back to these times, you can see that the daily salt intake was about half a gram of salt a day. And this is what you and I need to survive. We ate what we needed to live. Let's forward a few million years. And we can see here recommended daily allowances of salt. The one on the left, the lower one, is the, is the World Health Organization, five grams a day. The other one is the UK recommendations of six grams a day. So already you can see that governments and health organizations are putting in suggestions of our maximum intake, which is 10 times what we actually need. This is what I eat. We measured it in 2012, and I eat about eight grams a day, every day. And don't feel self-righteous. The UK, on average, eats 8.5 grams a day. It's the same in the US and most industrialized nations. We are eating massively more, amount, more salt than we possibly need uh, uh, to live uh, uh, healthy lives. And what does this mean? If we go back to our concepts of salt balance, we're absolutely out of whack. We're putting a massive burden 
on our kidneys primarily to excrete all this uh, salt. And the evidence is that they're not doing this very well. And the body is now putting that salt in places that it shouldn't be. It's putting it in our bones. It's putting it in our skin. And what does this mean for our health? It means that we're a world under pressure. All that you need to take from this image is this is, this, these are markers, a heat map of hypertension, high blood pressure. High blood pressure is everywhere. It affects all societies, it affects all socioeconomic classes, and it affects both genders. The World Health Organization re released very recently a, a document which recognized the uh, hypertension as a number one global health crisis. By 2025, it is estimated that one and a half billion people in the world will have hypertension. And they call it the silent killer because you do not know if you have hypertension or not because you don't feel ill. But it will kill you. It increases your risk of heart attack, of stroke, of kidney disease. So I'm going to ask you for two favors from today's talk, and this is favor number one. If you haven't done this already, go and get your blood pressure measured. Okay. So what's the solution to this crisis? Now, this is another one of my drawings. It's actually meant to be a cute and cuddly mouse and looks quite terrifying from where I'm standing. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, so the solution that we've taken in our lab and in labs across the world is say, can we identify these genes that are causing this, uh, this, this problem? And what we do is we take mice and they've evolved under the same conditions as we have. They have the same processes. We feed them high salt diets and we measure their blood pressure. And this is what happens. These are real data from the lab we got about a year ago. You can see on this side of the graph, caveman diet, mouse's normal diet. And after they hit that hashed bar, they're on our Western diets of high salt. And look what happens to blood pressure. It goes up fast and quickly. The interesting thing from all of these studies is we are talking about the same genes. And I guess this isn't surprising that evolution has made it this way, but the same genes which are holding salt in our kidney, in our gut, are the same pathways in our brain and the same pathways on our tongue. And these genes no longer fit our environment. So what do we do about it? I think you've got two options. One is change the genes, and we can't do that just yet. Although we've got other strategies, we can drug those genes. And that has been the option that's been preferred for the last 50 years or so. I prefer, and the idea I would like to get across to you, is that we should select option two. We should change our environment. And the evidence is that this is beneficial. This is the second half of that study. You can see over on this side of the graph what happens to those mice when we go back to caveman diet. Their blood pressure starts to come down. It's the same with chimpanzees. If you take away their salt in their diet, their blood pressure comes down. So why don't we do it? This is a study that I talked about right at the start when I measured my salt intake. I didn't actually tell you how you measure your salt intake. But what you do is you carry around a bucket and you collect all of your pee for 24 or 48 hours. And you make an estimate on the amount of salt that you've eaten from what's in the urine. Um, so I did this for a week or so, got my data of eight grams a day on the red bar. And then the next part of the study was to become salt aware, to look at the foods that I was eating, to try and reduce the amount of salt that I was taking in in my diet. What do you think happened? Did it go down? Yeah? Was I good? It was an epic fail. It went down a little bit, but it still stayed about seven and a half grams a day, higher than the recommended daily allowances. And this wasn't just a peculiarity of me. All of the other people in this study had exactly the same failure rate. So, two things we learned from this study. Collecting your pee in a bucket and carrying it around with you is a very weird feeling, I have to say. And nobody has ever looked at me quite the same including my wife. Um, the second and the most important thing we learned from this study is that it's very, very hard for you actually to reduce your salt intake. And why is that? Well, this 
is a food traffic light system. You've seen this. It's on the front of everything you buy. Do you read it? Who reads them? Oh, you are so good, you guys, I have to say. So this is a pizza from one of our major supermarkets. It's half of that 12-inch pizza, which I'd like you to note contains low-fat pepperoni. Great stuff. But half of that pizza contains half of your daily upper limit for salt intake. So we have a personal responsibility to ourselves and our families to engage more in how we spend our money on food and what is in the food that we need. The second responsibility, I firmly believe, lies with governments. And the UK government has been, for a number of years, in its different forms, very good at this. It's decided against a legislation policy and more of a cooperativity policy, working with food industries to meet standards. Uh, the, last standards were, the last standards were set in 2012, and since then, they've removed 11 million, 11 million kilograms from the food that we eat. Wow. The new reduction targets have just been set, and they come into, uh, into force next year, and they're setting aspirational uh, targets that should help us get our salt level down to World Health Organization recommendations. Okay, so the second favor that I'm going to ask you today is go away from this and become salt aware. Choose how you spend your money. Choose which food that you buy for yourself, your friends, and your family. Choose the low salt option. Go on the website for the good guys at Cash. They've got lots of advice about how you can make some really uh, quite nice dinners and things like that, and they can, all the data that I'm talking about today is there too. So, finally, we've come from a situation 2,000 years ago where salt was a, ve a, a, rare, a rare commodity, and if you spilled this, you put the devil on your shoulder. Today, we're in a different situation completely. Salt could well be that devil, that silent killer that is in our fridges, our freezers, and our food cupboards at home. We have to change this, and we can change it, and I think that's an idea worth spreading. Thank you.